So we're here with Kevin Kester, who is an Associate Professor of Comparative International Education and Peace Development Studies at Seoul National University. Uh, he just gave a keynote presentation on uh, peace education, and uh, it was very informative. Thank you very much. You talked about uh, peace in four different contexts. And uh, you talked about uh, how peace is interpreted by educators in, in various ways, depending on the context. How can we neutrally approach peace education? Uh, can peace, and consequently any peace-building effort, either through education or other development projects, um, be neutral? if it is defined by political, social, and cultural nuances. So th there's a lot in that. Um, uh, one of them, the idea that peace is contextually defined. Uh, and so we think, for example, uh, in Somaliland, one of the contexts that I talked about, that peace is the language that many of the educators use. And so they're very comfortable with this. Uh, but in other contexts like uh, Taiwan, peace was a word that was not comfortable. So for them, they preferred things like social movements or justice. Uh, or in Latin America, many educators also don't prefer the word of peace. They prefer democracy and human rights. So one of the lessons that we pull out of this is that peace, peace building must be contextually relevant, contextually located. So situated within the context in which it takes place. And so, and so that raises a challenge for us is can there be a universal definition or idea of what peace is and how it can be practiced across all contexts? So this, this tension that we have between standardization and particularization, and actually what we find in the literature and in practices is that it really needs to be particular, situated, located in that specific context. Uh, and this is the way that we, we go about promoting peace in a way that is appropriate, context dependent, uh, and it can be amenable and uh, understood and practiced better in, in each of these these contexts. But but I want to add something to what you asked because I, I think you know you emphasize that peace is the language that we're talking about. So the the talks on teaching for peace, but there's something that is inherent. Two things that are inherently embedded within this discussion. One is that is conflict. We can't talk about peace without conflict. Conflict is the core. Conflict and violence is the core of the discussion that we're discussing. So the, the problematic that peace and peace educators try to approach is conflict in all of its various forms, but understanding that conflict is a, potentially a good thing, and violence, and the multiple variations of types of violence that exist, and finding a way to overcome those. And the second thing that is embedded within this conversation about peace, and you heard me talk about it this morning, is justice. So to do peace work, peace building well, to do it in a way that is inclusive, that is diverse, requires us to focus on conflict and to focus on justice. That's the heart of what we're trying to address, even when we use the language of peace. You also talked um, about how sometimes maintaining the status quo is good for peace and sometimes maintaining the status quo makes things more complicated. Mm. How do we decide which one to follow in each context? I mean, I suppose in, you know, we're, we're practicing this in the everyday, in the here and now, uh, and responding in course to the problems that we currently face, right? Um, so if the status quo is amenable at the moment, Maybe we continue with the status quo. And we understand that this is a type of peace. We shouldn't dismiss it. Uh, because it, a lot of work went into creating this so-called status quo. Um, and it may, in fact, be a strategic way of keeping peace in the here and now. Uh, but in other cases, maybe we find that status quo is becoming stale. Uh, and it's allowing for forms of injustice to perpetuate under the surface. And in such a case, we need to find ways to work back and try either to reform the status quo uh, or to, in fact, transcend it and move beyond that status quo situation. But I think y your question really elicits a, a very important point that the strategic ambiguity of status quo can be a positive 
uh, state and a pro positive process. We shouldn't dismiss it so easily. Uh, and also that, you know, it is related to this, that always violence is an option. It's always on the table. So while we're discussing ways to overcome, to avoid, to get away from violence, we don't ignorantly assume that it's not on the table that people might be not be taking this option of violence. So when we discuss peace, we cannot ignore violence. It's fundamental. And the status quo is the way in between to move us in that direction, to move the needle in the direction of peace and away from violence. And as long as it continues to do that, it may be acceptable in the here and now. But if the needle begins to move toward violence, this is when we need to uh, rethink the status quo and whether it needs to be changed. So I, I think this will be my response to you right now. And in the contemporary world that we live in, we see conflicts in uh, Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, Russia, and elsewhere. What is your outlook? Are we moving towards establishing a good status quo or are we still stuck in the violence stage? Of what, what, is the, what does the future for peace education look like? So first in, in Gaza, we don't see conflict. <laughs> Uh, we see war, uh, we see devastation, we see armed conflict. We don't see the types of positive conflict that I was talking about before where conflict gives us an option. We see destruction. Um, and so I, I think we should call that for what it is. It's violence, it's war, uh, it's, it's not natural human conflict. Uh, and it has caused all of us as educators or peace educators to reflexively look in at how we do what we do and whether we're living up to the ideals of what we are preaching. Um, and so are we pushing for social movements? Are we pushing for social change? Are we holding states accountable? Are we having these public discussions about this? Or instead are we choosing to be mum on the topic and to ignore it because it's too difficult to discuss? Uh, and, and equally without taking sides. So, you know, th this is this huge challenge that we have and how to live up to my ethics and my normative principles but to do so in a way that doesn't take sides and close down the possibility of listening to and working with others and this is such a messy difficult job and so I think what's going on in Gaza right now uh, what's going on in Ukraine what happened in Afghanistan uh, a couple years ago and, and continues to take place really makes us introspect as peace workers on how this work may or may not be having positive effects. And I know some colleagues that have turned away from this work because of how distraught they are. They were, they were working in Afghanistan, they were promoting peace education, and then Taliban took over in August of 2021, and they felt that all of their work not only had been useless, but that it had contributed potentially to the acquiescence and acceptance of what happened in that context. Um, and, and so I think it offers the possibility for reflection for all of us as educators. And, and we need to think how we're responding to these issues. So then that leads me to the last question. Uh, how important is it to discuss exactly this topic at an international conference like this? What topics do we choose to discuss and what topics do we choose to omit? Uh, and when you have something going on that is such a world crisis as what's going on in the Middle East right now, it would be an injustice to ignore it, to shut it down. Uh, so it certainly needs to be discussed either in panels, either in speeches, uh, either in proclamations from IFOR. Uh, but certainly in the hallways and amongst the scholars who are, who are here, thinking about how our work is implicated in those problems or how our work is, is helping to mitigate some of these solutions in the short term and in the long term. So it, it's fundamental that we talk about these things here. Especially when security is compromised in specific context, it's good to come to an international place where it's safe to speak up and introduce issues yeah thank you very much thank you for your presentation and for this interview thank you thank you melina thank you very much and thank you all at ifor uh,
for inviting me and for such a wonderful conference. Uh, and to all the delegates who may come next year and into the future, uh, I wish you a wonderful time at IFOR. Thank you very much.